I'd love for you just to start out telling as much as you're comfortable with your story um, and part of it you told in your TED talk. I really resonated as well because when you, t- when you talked about having an anxiety attack, um, I've been through a season where I had some of those and it blindsided me. And I also went to the ER thinking I was having a heart attack and they said, you're fine. And I said, I don't feel fine. And, you know, really figuring out that the way that I was living uh, was creating all the stress that manifested in my body in some really crazy ways. And I kind of hit the wall and went through my own desert season. But I, I'd love to hear your story. And I have a thousand questions around being a, a attorney in murder trials, but I guess we're going to have to get away from that and get into today. So maybe those are for another day. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I just take us back to when you, when you were practicing law and, and maybe we'd jump in and, and kind of go forward from there. The uh, yeah, I was practicing law. I always wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be in the courtroom and I wanted to work specifically in criminal law and that's what I did. I did it for 20 years and specialized in really serious cases, felonies, murders, robbery, rape, tax fraud, bank fraud. Um, and uh, I absolutely loved it. It didn't feel like work to me. And uh, one day um, in the middle of, not in the middle, but near the end of a murder trial, um, as I reflect back, I, I know that was sort of a, a pivotal point for me, um, talking with a client in the ante room outside the courtroom uh, before closing arguments and um, really pivotal for me. And then, you know, a couple of years later, um, I, in, I'm in the courtroom on a very routine matter, just super, I mean, there was no contention in it at all. My chest started hurting. And uh, like you said, you know, I, I thought I was, I didn't know if I was having a heart attack or what, but I did go to the hospital and uh, my doctor said I was fine and that I needed to see a psychologist. And I did thankfully, and ended up taking Lexapro for, you know, five years or so and, and really trying to address this issue of what's going on, what is happening, because I don't love my job anymore. Hmm. And I'm sure many of your listeners can relate to this idea of, wait, this is what I wanted to do. And I've done it for a long time. Now I don't love it anymore, because I feel it, I, I, I can sense it in my mind, body and spirit. And uh, it wasn't that I fell out of love with you know, working on justice and defending people who were accused of crime, it was just the whole package just didn't fit with me anymore. But the problem is that I didn't know what else to do. Mm. I didn't, I didn't, I had a political science degree. I didn't want to run for office. And uh, so I had no other skills. And so I, I just did what lawyers do. I started researching and reading and and thinking that the research and reading and talking and uncovering every stone that I could, that 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 I would find the answer of what's next. And I, I just couldn't do it. So mm-hmm. I, I was literally searching in the darkness for about five years um, before I landed on chocolate. And um, I was still practicing law, still trying cases, still doing a good job. But, um, you know, I as I reflect back on it, I... I would not have minded if the process wouldn't have taken five years, but I I don't um, I I don't regret it. Mm. I don't regret that that sort of circuitous, um, sometimes really um, challenging path. I'm curious at that point when you went to the hospital thinking you're having a heart attack. I've I've had the same experience and. I wasn't having a heart attack and they said it's stress. And I said, I don't feel stressed. I'm fine. And <laughs> it turns out I was stressed and ended up learning about anxiety attacks and how those can cause these pains in your body that feel like really intense and can feel like a heart attack. I also did the Lexapro thing for a little bit. In my experience, I, I'm very type A. I, I gather that you're also type A. I really tried for a season to power through that. I, I didn't want that to be true of me, that I needed to acknowledge that I was overcommitted or overstressed or that I had some work to do in this psychological space to figure out why my body was doing this. Did you try to power through? Did you get curious really quick? How did you respond to that? The first thing I did was, um, and this is like right at the end of that murder trial, I thought, gosh, what is happening? So the first thing I did, um, which is what a lot of people do, is I bought a convertible Mercedes. Um, <laughs> and Or maybe not a Mercedes. People buy Ferraris and other stuff. I could only afford a Mercedes. So I, I was like, well, this will do it. I mean, surely I'll feel better buying this thing. And uh, that, that lasted for about four months, and, and I sold it. And uh, that was my first kind of awareness 
you know, response was to buy a car. And so I didn't have a, I didn't have a high amount of self-awareness at that point, but I, but I did have enough to know that something was wrong. And so I didn't stop there and I continued to explore what, what is happening? Why am I, um, feeling this anxiety? Why am I sensing it? Why am I no longer passionate about this job? And uh, so all the while trying to find, am I going to buy a business? Am I going to start a business? Am I, what, what, you know, praying about this? I prayed about it every day. Very simple pr prayer. Dear God, please give me something else to do. Mm. And, 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 and I did that for, like I said, almost five years. And so what happened is, yes, I did try to power through it. At first, I thought, well, maybe it's criminal law. And I started to do take on some civil cases and, and still in the courtroom. But uh, that didn't it wasn't happening for me. And I it was OK. But I needed to I needed to feel almost in my whole body um, a sense of inspiration about the work that I was doing. And it wasn't happening. So as I tried to power through it in, in my law career, I, I just was I felt like I was just reaching a dead end. Um, and that that was, I think, really the low point for me when I when I felt like that it wasn't going to happen, that I wasn't going to feel this kind of inspiration again. And that's when I sort of just stumbled into this volunteer job at the at the hospital. I know oftentimes when leaders especially if you've been doing something for 20 years and you're great at it. Um, there's this sense of, of a, a, a humbling uh, when we go through things like this. And oftentimes getting through it is dependent on people around us who are instrumental in giving advice or giving encouragement. Uh, oftentimes the people who stay in that valley the rest of their life, uh, they stay isolated. Uh, did you have people who were cheering for you? Did you have people that you were confiding in and saying, I am struggling with this. How, what do you think? How, how do I get to this next place in my life that there's more clarity about what I'm supposed to be doing? I will say, we talked about my wife. We've been married for 33 years and she's my biggest cheerleader, but this was a struggle for her because, you know, she helped put me through law school and uh, I was at the top of my game. I'd never lost a jury trial. I made a lot of money, a whole lot of money. Um, and, you know, I didn't have to worry about credit card debt. Dave, are you listening? Um, and <laughs> he's probably not, but. Um, He'll listen. But, uh, okay, cool. Um, and so anyway, no, I didn't, I, I made that kind of money and we, we spent within our means. And so it was a challenge for her. But in answer to your question, the, the, the person that, that really was a um, sort of an anchor point for me was um, Father Cyprian, who is a monk at Assumption Abbey, a Trappist monastery uh, in the Mark Twain National Forest about an hour and a half from Springfield, Missouri. And uh, I started going there on retreat about 20 years ago. And he was um, a person who was kind of willing to provide some spiritual direction at that point. He's 90 now. Um, and, but in those years, I would go there on retreat. I'm, now I'm a family brother there. So I, I live with the monks when I go there. I live behind the cloister. I follow their schedule. It's a, a long story. I write about it in my book. But, um, but even to this day, I talk to him frequently. And he has been a sort of guiding light for me in a very gentle, subtle, non-judgmental way. And so um, I would say that he has been a, a, a stabilizing force in my life, and especially mm -hmm. during those years. And I'm not Catholic, but the Catholics would call this period a, the Paschal Mystery. Mm -hmm. And so the Paschal Mystery is this representation of the valley uh, that we can find ourselves in and we can't see the mountaintop. We, know, we, 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 we don't even know that it's there at this point in the depth of the valley or really it's representation in the Hebrew Bible is the Exodus. You know, it's this, it's this notion of darkness before light. And ultimately it's about uh, the death and resurrection of Christ and this, and it's embodied in the Paschal mystery. And so he helped walk me through the Paschal mystery of that time in my mm. life. I think this is really key for leaders listening because at some point in your time as a leader, business owner, entrepreneur, you're going to hit a wall. 
and and I have found in my own experience, I'm hearing this in your story, and I've seen dozens of cases where leaders hit that wall and they do one of two things. They either run up into the wall and they blow up in this ball of fire, or they find somebody as a guide, as a mentor, or several people and, and make sure that they're not isolated. And, and these people help us navigate through that storm. And we grow through that. And, and like you said, it, we go from darkness to light. We have this more enlightened uh, approach to what we're supposed to do with our lives and how we lead. It's a, it's a transformational experience if we navigate that storm um, in the proper way. Uh, but it can also be the beginning of the end. And it, I, I think it, you know, the difference is not being alone and, and having people around you that you can talk to. I think you raise a very important point because especially in this age, we we are sort of falsely um, presuming that with all of the technology and access to information that we have, that somehow uh, that will insulate us from, as you said, the impact of the wall, that the, that the ultimate effect won't be as great because surely with all of the information at our fingertips, we can find the answer and the answer will, you know, sort of buffer that impact. But in fact, um, it's not true um, because you, you can't have a relationship with a book. Hmm. And, um, but you can have a relationship with a person. Uh, you can experience um, what it feels like to receive kindness, to receive compassion. You can't receive that from a book. Yes. I mean, you can be inspired by a book. So true. But um, you can't receive that from Google. Google will give you all kinds of answers. I mean, there's, it's, I mean, yesterday I'm looking at, uh, we're looking at technology for, um, you know, Oculus glasses and can we find ways to be in meeting rooms together remotely? I mean, but that, but technology ultimately is not going to be a place where we um, find the embodiment of compassion um, and humility and, kinship and mutuality. So that comes from people. So thank you for, for bringing that mm -hmm. up because I think it's very important. Yeah. Well, we know the punchline. Yeah. You spend five years and ultimately you get into chocolate, but I, I want to hear about the season right before you had the clarity that it mm -hmm. was going to be a chocolate company. Uh, you with your talent, with your background, with your, your resume, there's a lot of things you could have done really well. You obviously have the drive and the passion that whatever you put your mind to was going to be successful. What was it that got you to say, "Hey, it's going to be chocolate"? Hmm. The uh, well, I told you it was a pretty circuitous path, but the 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 thing for me is after I bought the Mercedes and sold it and started um, kind of having a, almost an awakening of self awareness that I hope that leaders will experience before uh, they hit the wall, um, or maybe they need to hit the wall and that might wake them up to a place of self-awareness. Like, wow, I just hit a wall. What's happening here? Um, and because I think that this, this is really the sort of, uh, preamble to any kind of creativity. And it's a Genesis point for all sorts of things, starting companies, changing careers, staying in careers. But for me, what happened is, um, I, I decided that I needed to have a conversation with the brokenheartedness in my own life. And I think that this is true for everyone, not just business leaders, but we all at some point need to speak to our own broken heart. And mine was my dad's death when I was 14. He died of lung cancer. He was a lawyer, you know, a former Marine physically fit. And I was with him when he died. And it was just terrible, you know, and the, the the church people would come over and pray and speak in tongues. And it kind of freaked me out as a 13 year old. And and they would say he's going to be healed and and uh, the claim his healing. And the leader of the group said, Sean, don't ever talk with your dad about death, because if you do, then it'll be a sign of doubt and Jesus won't heal him. Wow. And I believe that. And my dad would try to talk to me about it. And I'd push him away and say, Dad, don't say things like that. You're not going to yeah. live. And he died and fast forward, you know, 25 years later and, you know, I'm winning cases and making money and buying Mercedes and, and uh, hmm. just wasn't working for me. So I thought, you know, I need to talk to that broken heart because it's still there. It doesn't matter how many years go by. You and I can have a conversation offline and I could probably talk to you for five minutes and, and learn if you were willing to share 
your own broken heart. Well, it's we, funny you say uh, that. It, and, I, it doesn't have to be offline. I had a very similar experience. My mom had cancer when I was a boy. And okay. we were at a church where they said very similar things that, you know, we're going to speak life and it's she's going to be healed. And if she's not healed, it it implied a, a lack of faith. And well, then she ends up dying. And yeah. you can imagine the at a spiritual level, just the the shame and the guilt and, and that environment. And and the story has been redeemed many times over. And, it, and it's it's amazing to look back in hindsight now and, and see how God's used all of that. But um, I think you're right. We all have these broken places and you and I, we lost our parents, but I, I think leaders listening, may, they may go, well, I didn't lose my, pa- I'm not really broken. And mm-hmm. I would say we all have something broken somewhere that needs to be healed. And, and it may not yeah. have been as tragic as losing one of your Absolutely. parents. But um, when you say having a conversation with your broken heartedness, uh, what does that look like? It looks like walking alone on a road and not having music or anyone, but just my own thoughts um, combined with a sort of walking prayer, if you will. Um, The contemplatives would say resting in the presence of God. This is without agenda. It's just walking along and thinking um, with the backdrop um, and surrounded by this notion of union um, and it's a sacred conversation because of its intention. And um, so this is what it looked like for me, literally walking. I don't mean like metaphorically, I mean like walking down the road, mm. uh, you know, out in the, in the forest uh, where this uh, monastery is and, and, uh, and, and just letting these things kind of flow over me. And to back up just one point, I would say, yes, I talk to people too, who say, well, I haven't experienced that kind of tragedy. Um, but when, when I um, hear people say, well, I, I really don't have a broken heart. Hey, if you're 30 or 40 or 50 and you tell me you don't have a broken heart, well, then I say, we need to talk about your life. Yeah. Let's get you a broken heart. Right. You know, and it's important um, because uh, we, 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 we grow from these experiences. And so in that conversation that, that, that we're talking about here, in that conversation with my own grief, my own broken heart, this idea came to me to, to go to the hospital and volunteer on Fridays in the palliative care unit, which is hospice in the hospital. Essentially, everybody's dying mm-hmm. in, this, in this. And I visited just, I, I didn't, I, I was just a volunteer. You know, I'd go, um, like I said, on Fridays, I did it for almost five years. I'd knock on the door. Many of these patients didn't have anybody. They were in the oncology unit, uh, cardiology or ICU. And, um, you know, I would read to them out of the Bible or talk about whatever. And I always concluded by saying, hey, um, one of the things I do as a volunteer is pray for people. Would you like me to say a prayer for you? Um, almost everybody who's dying will take a prayer. I learned this. <laughs> and, mm. um, and then here's the key. This is the key is I would say, okay, well, um, what would you like me to pray for? I didn't presume for them without asking, and this would open up a whole discussion for them of what they wanted me to pray for. And uh, I would listen and I would repeat their words and prayer back to them. I'd ask if I could, you know, touch their shoulder or hold their hand while I repeated their words and prayer right back to them. And some would say, would you pray that I'm healed so I can walk out of here? I did that. Or would you pray that I die today because I'm in pain? I did that. Or pray for my family or pray that I live a couple of weeks for a wedding anniversary or whatever. I did that. And this is the sort of penultimate um, point, I think, here, is that during those moments, which were measured in seconds, I actually thought about someone else besides me. Hmm. And what I did is I'd leave their room and go to the next person. And then when I would leave the hospital, I'd walk out to my car and sometimes I would, what I would do is I'd, I'd go into the chapel before and I would pray about these names of people I was going to go see. And then I would do it at the end of the visit. And I would just say a little prayer for those people that I'd just been with. And so then when I would walk to my car, sometimes, not every time, only a few times, I'd walk out to my car and it's as if I was walking on air almost. My mm-hmm. feet 
weren't touching the ground. They were, but I, maybe they weren't. And um, so to your listeners who were thinking, well, that sounds morbid. You're just with people who are dying and you're, why, what, what's, what's going on there? Well, what's going on is joy. Hmm. That's what happened. And Khalil Gibran says that our greatest joy is our sorrow unmasked. And that's what I, that is the result of the conversation with my broken heart that expressed itself in just complete and utter joy because it was from a place of deep pain mm. within my own broken heart, which was just as broken then as it was 25 years ago when I'm standing at my dad's bedside and he takes his last breath. Wow. Because the, our broken hearts are not uh, on calendar time, right? They're not. Mm. They aren't. And uh, yeah, it's our often said that are, emotions yeah. don't understand time. I mean, it's no, no, that feeling right. we have a trigger that causes us to have a feeling that's the same feeling we had 20 years ago. Yes. And yes. our emotions can't tell the difference between that it actually was 20 years ago and now we're safe. And it, it feels like it's right now. We're, we're re experiencing right. that same thing. Yeah. Which is, which is awesome because it gives us some glimpse of eternity, mm -hmm. I think. And, um, and the, the sort of massive, you know, um, experience that we can have with our emotions, both good and sometimes traumatic. And so anyway, it's from that experience, um, not while I was at the hospital yeah. or not, but just what it did is it, that, that experience provided clarity to me. It gave me space. You're a type A person. I am. And so often, um, at least for me, I, I was so bound up in researching the answer and finding the answer it was just litter and I was just so tight that I couldn't loosen up and create space for, you know, really crazy things to come into my head, like making chocolate from mm. scratch. And so that's what, that's how it happened. I'm and within curious three if, months of me. Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, during that phase, did you notice as you're doing the volunteering and, and feeling this joy, did your body start to shift? I mean, you, you go back to when you had the anxiety attack and you're bound up emotionally and spiritually and, and then physically that's manifesting. Did you see a progress towards health where mind, body, and soul were starting to feel more, more levity in the, in the experience? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say a little bit, a little bit, but I also at that time was experiencing some other health things that were kind of scary. And, um, but it was a time of healing for me. So right about the time that I, started this company, I did turn a corner, um, in some physical healing and, um, but it, you know, gosh, sometimes these things, especially chronic type things, it, 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 it can feel like it's so long and there's no progress. And that can be a, a real source of depression and anxiety. And it was for me, but I started to turn the corner about mm -hmm. that time too. So you get the clarity that you can have joy again. You get the clarity that being an attorney is, what got you here, but it's not going to be your life going forward. And you jump into right. chocolate. Right. And then what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so within, within a few months of this idea popping into my head, I was in the Amazon and I, I found a way down there to go visit farmers who were growing cocoa beans. I'm still, you know, practicing law. I come back from that trip and it was a real sort of, I'd never been in primary force. I didn't know what it was. I, I mean, this is, this was a, a real creation experience for me. Um, I, I mean, I'd traveled around the world a little bit, but I'd never seen anything that was just so much. I mean, the Amazon is just, uh, well, I can, can't say it better. It was a creation experience where I was just in utter awe that, you know, I could take like 10 steps in one direction and I would never find my way back, mm. you know, to anything. And, um, so I came back from that experience and I started, I, I did all the stuff. I mean, I started putting a business plan together. I bought a building, started winding down my law practice. That took a year um, and uh, bought equipment. Nobody was doing bean to bar chocolate then really. There were about three of us in the country starting at the same time. So it was hard to learn. And uh, I started uh, buying cocoa beans and started, I've been traveling to buy cocoa beans every year from every farm since 2005 until this year. This mm -hmm. is the first year I've not been traveling to buy those cocoa beans. Unpack a little more what bean to bar means. When I'm, 
So I'm going to these places. And right now I source cocoa beans in Davao, Philippines, in Ecuador, in the Amazon, southern part of Ecuador, northern Peru, and in a, a very remote village in southwestern Tanzania. I go there. I meet with farmers. I, I, I was This summer, I would have taken my 48th origin trip. Um, and these, these places take a long time to get to. Um, and they're hot and, and uh, often very remote. And the farmers are in varying degrees of poverty. Hmm. And I've met with them. I help them open bank accounts. I help them become exporters so they can re- reduce the number of middlemen and women. I share profits with them. And Dave, if you're listening, you'll appreciate this. But we open our books to the farmers. And we translate our financial statements into their language. So when I'm in Tanzania, our financials are in Swahili. Mm. So they can understand how we calculate their profit share. We give them money, hand them cash. And um, then we get their cocoa beans. And the cocoa beans end up at my factory in Springfield, Missouri. And we make chocolate from those beans. We roast them and grind them and, and turn it into a chocolate bar. That's fantastic. I've got a chocolate bar here and uh, towards the end of the show, I'm going to eat it and do a little taste test here. And you're going to tell me what I'm eating. I can't wait for that. I'd like to fast forward to that, but there's more to the story. (laughs) Uh, Clearly, this wasn't just about chocolate for you. Uh, You have the sense of purpose to uh, really just have an impact on humans, Uh, your employees, these farmers, the customers. How how much has purpose meant for you? How do you define purpose? Uh, what, What is the thing that gets you out of bed every day that's beyond just the chocolate bar? The, the thing, the answer to that question is what you um, raised eloquently a moment ago, which is that the beginning point of this and the, the sort of help along the way was a person. These are people. This is about relationships. And so that's what this chocolate business is about. It's not about a cocoa bean or a bar. It's about people. And it always has been and always will be. And so that's um, the driving force here. Well, why? It's because it's with people that we have the opportunity to experience love. Yes, we can experience love of nature um, and we can love animals. Um, We can love the beautiful sunshine. But there is no other comparable love, um, I believe, than that of love of our fellow human beings and to be in relationship with them because it truly is an experience of the divine. And that's what this is all about. I love it. That's what it's about. Well, I want you to say more about this and and the connection to people because we believe so much at Entree Leadership that purpose is the thing that is the foundation for a peak performing business. And oftentimes because we're Ramsey Solutions, we're Entree Leadership, it's easy for a business owner to look at us and go, well, yeah, you guys are saving marriages. You're changing the world. You know, it's easy for y'all to be missional and feel like you have a purpose. We're just fill in the blank. And here we are with the product that you have. You, you could almost say to some degree as a commodity, it's, it's chocolate. Now, I know you have a very special way of doing this and it tastes amazing. So I'm not diminishing the excellence of the quality, but, but you're more in the space that a lot of business owners are, which is I'm thinking of my friend uh, Chris in Arizona, and they have a window graphics company and they put graphics on windows of vehicles and signage and that kind of thing. How do you help a Chris who does window graphics understand it's not about the graphics, just like you understand, it's not just about the chocolate bar. Well, uh, you've, you, you teed it up for me. I don't play golf, but if I did, this would be perfect because one of the things I write about this, I talk about this, I say this all the time. It's not about the chocolate. It's about the chocolate. Hmm. Well, to some people that sounds very confounding. Uh, maybe it's a little Buddhist, because it's very non-dual in its thinking and in its expression. So when I say that this isn't about chocolate, for, for us, for example, I mean, it's about these farmers that we're sharing profits with, that we give money to. Um, it's about young people in my town of Springfield, Missouri, that where we created this program called Chocolate University to engage young people in our business so that they can understand that small business can be a force for good in the world. Yes. And that they can know there's a world beyond Springfield, Missouri. It's we're, we've just surpassed feeding 1 million meals to malnourished school children in Tanzania and the Philippines. Wow. All self all sustainable with zero donations. We in January we opened a preschool in remote Tanzania for 300 kids to have early childhood education for the first time in the entire region. And so that's not about chocolate. 
It's not. It's but almost it like is chocolate. About is, chocolate. It's like chocolate's the vehicle that lets you get to all those yes, things. Yes, yes, yes. But it, it's 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 circular in the sense that it is about the chocolate, and yes, it is a vehicle to it because this idea of vocation, which is what we call it, or you could say calling, but this idea of vocation um, is driven by multiple facets. It's not just chocolate. But the but but here's the here is the where where I want to deepen this a little bit and suggest this. You you are not able, the royal you is not able to separate our um, behavior as a company from the product that we produce. So what I mean by this is not in a new age woo woo sort of way. I'm telling you that if I gave our cocoa beans and our sugar and our machines to somebody, you know, two counties over and said, here's the recipe, it would not be the same chocolate bar Mm. as the one that we produce. So what I'm saying is, is that who we are as a company collectively informs the product or service that we provide or make. And this is, and depending on the the degree to which this is executed in a company, they are literally inseparable. And so this isn't like we have a department in the company of community service and everything else is, oh, let's go make chocolate. It's all wrapped up. It's all tied up. I don't track my time of uh, when am I working on the chocolate university program or feeding kids or when am I working on marketing? It's, it's just all part of the same thing. And so what I would say to Chris, and then and th- th- I love this point because I, you will, you can look on my website, you can look, look in my book, you can look in our chocolate bar packaging. I do not like the phrase social entrepreneurship. I think it should be removed from the business lexicon. Hmm. It is, it's not good. Why? This isn't about social business. It's about business. It's just good business. So if Chris, Chris in, 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 um, let's say he's in, did you say Phoenix? Yeah. Outside outside of Phoenix. Okay. Uh Okay. So Chris is, he is running his business in a way. It's not about the graphics it, but it is about the graphics because Chris has a, a coworker who, whose wife is suffering. She's suffering from, something and and she's she's debilitated and chris knows that this co-worker is struggling because of what's happening with his spouse and chris is is providing kindness and compassion to this co-worker or maybe it's somebody down the street or maybe it's someone he knows about that he drinks coffee with or and 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 chris doesn't have a label of social business on right. his right. neon sign in front it's the, it's good business yes. because he acts he behaves in a way that is kind with mutuality with kinship with others in his community in his neighborhood and and this is how his pro- this is what this is what makes chris's product better this is what makes it fun to work at Chris's business Yes, because people care about other people and they're not saying to themselves, well, you know, we can't care about that person today because we didn't get 10 sales calls in today. So we're not going to be kind to that person. Hmm. No, 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 no. That's not the way his business operates. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is he has the opportunity to have a heart and to use his heart and really big businesses oftentimes um, get so consumed with the bottom line and the growth and the machine of, you know, and especially public companies, it's all about Q1 and Q2. Right. And you have to lose your heart to do that. You you can only approach it with, you know, from a, from a place of the mind and right. transactions. And, hey, I'm sorry your wife's sick, but we got productivity and you're a unit of production here and you got to produce, baby, or otherwise you can't stay. And right. it's really sad when businesses get to that point. But it's why I love small business, because oftentimes the the founders, the owners like Chris, who are in it with his coworkers, they really can express that compassion. And, and that's what you're saying you're doing with, with the chocolate company and your team there. It is what we're doing, and we've been doing it for 14 years. And of course, there are instances where you have to make choices. This is what business is about. Um, it's not perfect. In fact, the imperfection of it is what makes it beautiful, really. Um, because small business, this is—I mean, I, you know, there, there, you can go to the 
major universities in the country, and all of them have either departments or classes that are called, you know, social business or social entrepreneurship. Right. And they need to stop yeah, that. I they agree. just need to teach business. I agree. Well, if you look at business the right way, you go, it, you know, it is this vehicle that we get to show up and, and there's actually a nobility in work. You know, I mean, we see this, there's a biblical case for, you know, we were given vocations, we were given callings, you know, God told the very first chapter of the Bible, uh, we're given uh, this guy, Adam, and he's given a job description, go name the animals, go tend to the garden, you know, you have a job to do, there's something holy and just doing the work and doing it with excellence and really caring about the outcome and and the people who are on the other end of that. Well, it gives us an opera. I mean, the math people say we're going to spend 80,000 hours at work on average, well, if given that truth, then what better place other than work would there be for us to express our humanity? Yeah, it's a real opportunity for us. Um, And the great spiritual teachers through the centuries, um, I think, have given us a framework where we can be compassionate and kind and have a business all at the same time. Mm. I love it. One of the things you talk about in your book that I found to be uh, interesting, and I'm not sure I fully have digested this, whether whether I agree or, or maybe we philosophically agree, but you're you're saying it in a different way. Don't scale, reverse scale. Uh, we talk about all the time scaling a business, building a business, becoming a peak performing business. If it's worth doing, take it to the moon. Life short, baby, go get it. Uh, it's very Western. It's very American. And I, I think in some context, if you're if you're doing something that matters, why not do more of it? Um, but it sounds like you're you're maybe taking a different angle on this. I am, and I think that chapter in the book should be read in tandem with chapter three, which is um, titled "How Much Is Enough." And and I don't mean just how much is enough money. I mean how many Instagram likes is enough? Uh, how many hits on your YouTube channel is enough? Uh, how much? Top line sales is enough. If we can, of course, these are moving targets, but as business people, if we can get together and at least address the fact of this moving target before we get there, I don't just mean goals or big goals. I mean, but these, these things that um, are the everyday stuff of of our business, then before we reach them, we can understand um, the value of what is enough. I learned this from the monastery. They basically operate on the sufficiency economy. I mean, they make in my monastery, they make enough fruitcakes to support the monastery. Hmm. That's it. They could make more. And so I I mean, we we know, we we all know that more is not enough. And when people are trampling over each other and on Black Friday and killing people to get through the door of fill in the blank big store then we've got a problem. And so what I'm suggesting in both of these chapters is that, well, uh, and, and, and what I'm about to say is um, I think from what I know perfectly in line with the Dave Ramsey philosophy. Um, and the, the, the idea is instead of challenging the business people in our world to grow and by grow, we mean bigger sales more partners, more mm-hmm. investors, more stores, more units, more franchisees, more sales. But what, what doesn't get talked about a lot is, well, what about um, reducing debt? What, what, right. why, what about that? That's right. growth. Yeah. That is absolutely growth, reducing debt. Um, what about learning how to operate with what you have out of your cash flow? Yeah. That's growth. Sure. That's what we're focused on. Mm. And so my challenge to the culture is I'm essentially saying, yes, of course, there are, and we're in a place right now, scale is important. When we're talking about a vaccine, let's talk scale, please. I'm begging you, let's talk scale. But when we're talking about a small business, if all, if, if, if your, if your focus is on scale, 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 because of all of the pressures of your community, your friends, your family, your investors, or just the books that you read, sure, you will become swept away. Yeah, yeah. You will, you will, before you know it, be untethered to the reason that you started the business in the first yeah. place. Well, you'll implode. And, and I think what you're hitting on is something I do agree with. And that is that consumerism will not create fulfillment, but I don't think you're saying to Chris in Arizona, 
that if he has a coworker that he's able to help and the the nobility of his work has this this broader purpose that having more coworkers to help and 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 building this from a place of how can, how can we help more people uh, we're not saying that you don't grow if what you're doing is is meaningful uh, sure and at the same time we can get so trapped in this idea of it's all about growth and if we're not growing right. we're dying and if we're dying we're you know it's it's bottom line driven and it's not human to human driven is what it sounds like you're right. saying. Yes. Thank you for, yes. I, another, I think another um, way to say reverse scale is human scale. Mm. So I'm not suggesting that Chris not grow. What I'm suggesting is, is that he fully understands the vision of his company in a 10 year cycle or even a 20 year cycle. And he understands in his mind how much is enough, how much is enough debt, how much is enough net operating income. And he, he of course, that these things will change. But if when he understands that, then he will also hopefully along the way of starting his business, he will have encountered the divine. Hmm. I, I, I have. You know, and and I'm not, it doesn't happen every day. I've been doing this for 14 years, and I would say there are three or four instances where I've, you know, seen the curtain lift, so to speak, and I've had, you know, just a glimpse of it. And when Chris is in in this business, and he's had the chance to maybe help somebody or 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 just be shoulder to shoulder with someone who needs him, then he probably has experienced it too. But what I'm saying is that as long as he is strong in understanding that that tether, this is the, the, his behavior, the way he treats people in his company and out of his company, and the, the mindset that he has and had about why he started this business, as long as he holds that tether as he grows, then he won't lose it. But this requires discipline. Mm in our culture because the cultural pressure is to grow because we even despite our our very um, good efforts we are we're challenged by the bank um, and and partners that we must do this and what i'm saying is at least for me yes i'm i grow but i don't want to become a huge company um, because I, I want to be able to experience the things that I'm experiencing and not delegate them to other people for me, just for me. You talk about this idea of discipline and I'd, I'd like to connect this to something you speak to in your book. And it's something that I've seen Dave Ramsey model. I I've experienced this myself and the value in this. And, and that is the, the time that a leader needs to take to be away and be alone and to recharge their batteries. Uh, we get going so fast. There's so much white noise. And when we sign up for the responsibility of being a leader, it's difficult to be off. Uh, the team needs us. We've got to show up. We've got a obligation. We've got a responsibility. We've got customers. And if you're not careful, the thing that you love can be, it could be an amazing, beautiful thing. And it can also at scale, <laughs> like you're talking about, it can, it can suck your soul dry. <laughs> yeah. And you have found a way to to unplug and turn it off and, and get away and recharge. I, I've done some of these personal retreats, and I got to tell you, the first time that I did it, uh, I didn't know what to do with myself. I, it was just so weird to feel like I'm offline and I'm by myself, and I felt lonely, and then I felt excited, and then I thought, what am I doing? And I should just go home and get back to work. And I was so tempted the whole time to open up my email and look because I just felt that addiction to that that dopamine hit that we get from opening yes. the next thing. Yes. Say more about these retreats and, and the value for leaders to whether it's at a monastery or just, a, you know, a long weekend away with a hotel somewhere, sure. yeah. getting alone and getting silent and listening. The the word I, I I'm, thank you for using the word addiction, because let's call it what it is. I mean, we are in many cases, especially leaders who are you know reading a lot, we're consuming tons of information uh, in order to make good decisions, provide good leadership. Um, we operate at a very high, um, high uh, revolution, and um, we are a sort of, in some, in many ways, addicted to this distraction um, or to distraction. And so it's hard and harder and become harder to truly unplug. And so for me, I think it's important if you can go anywhere, you can go to a monastery or you can go to, a, like you said, a hotel. But I think if it would be best especially if you're just beginning this 
to go to a place where you will not have the internet. So you can't get it even if you want it. Hmm. And those places, places are becoming fewer and fewer to, um, to be found. But um, so that I think is one of the first things. And that is, can we get away from the internet? Can we get away from email? Get away from this distraction? And I will, and you, you pointed this out. At the beginning, it's painful. Why? Because we're not used to being alone with our own thoughts. We're used to being able, we're, we're used to being able to substitute that for something else. A podcast, a book, yes. Um, talking to a friend, texting, whatever, Facebook, Instagram, the whole thing. And so this is this is the challenge I believe of our age, is to be alone with our thoughts. And in the beginning of when I started doing these retreats, I, I you know I'd bring twenty books with me. They they, didn't, they they still don't have the internet at Assumption Abbey, but so I would like bring all my books, bring my Bible, bring the Bible study Bible, bring, bring it all, you know, <laughs> Tuesdays with Maury, which is kind of where this whole thing started. And, you know, I just, I bring, I bring those and, you know, now I, I go and I don't bring anything. I bring nothing. And that, you know, that took me 20 years. And, um, and so I think if we can just take baby steps, then we will find great, um, um, I don't want to, how can I say, I don't want to like uh, oversell this because the, I, I've come back from retreats and not felt good at all. And especially if you put, if you, if you are going to overlay any faith component to this, if you go on a retreat with some prayer agenda that you think you're going to get all your answers, you know, in a long weekend or a week of man, uh, you can't, it's sure. uh, yes, it's yeah. possible, but you can also be for in for some real pain. Um, um, and in struggle. And, but I think this is very important. And I think, you know, people are listening. I'm like, great. This doesn't sound like fun at all. Why would I want it? I can just, you know, go to the beach. Just well, sign and it can me also up for, kinda, you know. I, I think it's that. And okay. So what's the value? Am I going to stare at my yeah, okay. belly button all weekend? And then I come back and I, I, what, I had a, I slept a little bit more. I, I've got some <laughs> yeah. physical energy. All of it. I mean, what's, all of what's it. the real benefit here? Because I got well, a what business do you want? to run, Sean, you know, what do you, what do you want? Say That's my, my that. question. Well, the, what benefit do you want as a leader? Do you want to, do you want a weekend um, of clarity? Are you looking for rest? Um, are you looking for prayer? Are you looking for answers? Are you looking to like start journaling? And if you, if, if you can begin with a simple intention and try to do this more than once over a period of time, then you will find either a, that you're achieving the thing that you set out to achieve it's very simply or B that something else happened. That's quite mysterious. So, um, you know, I am, um, a prayerful person and I, so I have, you know, I, I don't just limit this to going on a retreat because it's hard to do now. And so, so I have things that I do in the morning, um, during, during the day, um, to sort of have a mini retreat. Um, can we say, you know, to sort of, um, point me in the right direction hmm. for the day. And, um, this doesn't have to be a big deal. And so we're, we're, tra we, we sort of train our body, mind, and spirit to be ready for these longer retreats. And for me, so it's hard, it, you know, for me, I can't speak to just being on a retreat, only for rest, although that's certainly happened. But for me, it's a it's a very it's a very um, faith driven process. So for me, for twenty years, you know, this has been this has been uh, it's been hard. I've I've shed tears at these you know these retreats at, at Assumption Abbey um, or coming back. I've I've found that I wasn't rested. You know, I've come back tired. Hmm. Um, but it's all about prayer. It is all about this um, contemplative notion of resting in God's presence. And that is, that is not some end goal. It's a process to this very day, to this morning, to this very morning of trying to um, rest in his presence. And so this is, this is I, I don't even want to use the word goal or what am I going to get out of it? Mm. For me, what I get out of it is, can I, in, can I in my life in this world discover my true self on a daily basis? Can I see him? Can I get to know him? That is that God created soul in me that 
kind of woke up a little bit 20 years ago, you know, maybe one eye half open the guy who bought the Mercedes, you know, can I, can I get to know him better? Can I continue to have conversations with, with my own broken heart yes. in that sense? That's what it, that's what yes. I'm going to get out of yeah. it for me, for Sean. That's what I get. Well, you're hitting on something that's so important and we teach this all the time in entree leadership. And that is that you as the leader are the linchpin to, to use a Seth Godin phrase. <laughs> yes. You're the variable. You're the difference maker. And we are not just the leader who's the business person. Uh, we're a entire person, mind, body, heart, and soul. And if we don't create right. environments to invest in our own growth, we will become the lid on the organization. We will become limited in what we are capable of doing, what we're called to do, if we're not recharging our own batteries and taking care of our heart. and. You know, it, it can feel funny if you've never done that before, but I'm, I'm glad that you're doing it. And I'm glad that you abdicate that because a lot of leaders that I know that are very successful and sustainable long-term, a lot of it's about right. sustainability, right. Uh, are doing things like this that are feeding their soul. And and that on the surface, there's not a lot of utility in it. And, and that's kind of the paradox. Exactly. You go, but yes. where's the utility? And like you said, what's the goal? And you kind of go, there's not a goal except to connect right. to something that is bigger than you are. You know, your creator, uh, you know, is out there and you're, you're connecting to uh, him in a new way that uh, you can't do just in the daily grind. I mean, Joseph Campbell says that we really don't, people are really not looking for meaning. What they're really looking for is an affirmation to know that they are joyfully alive. Hmm. So when was the last time that as a business person, as a leader in your job, that you felt joyfully alive. That this isn't going to happen every day, but as leaders, you know, can we pursue those opportunities to experience this notion of living a joyful life just in a moment? Hmm. And then the key here is as a for anyone, but especially for a leader is how can I come back from that moment of just knowing that I'm joyfully alive and integrating that into my business, into, in, into my life, um, into my family. Um, this is what it's about. It's about coming back from that. And I'm not even really saying so much a peak experience because that would sort of oversell it. But, but it's, it's about how we take these larger experiences and integrate them into our business, into our life, into our personhood so that we can, at least in my world, um, get to know God better and understand my true self. Yeah. You know, I love that, you know, I'm sitting here talking for the last hour to the real live Willy Wonka, and we haven't even talked about chocolate. <laughs> uh, we're talking about our hearts and our minds and our souls and people. And, you know, it's just such a good mm -hmm. reminder that that really is what life is about. But I do want to talk about the chocolate and I've got a chocolate Please. bar in front of me here. Okay. And I need yep. you to tell me what I'm about to have a bite of. This is a beautiful packaging. Uh, it says uh, Tanzania on the front. There's a picture yeah, of Mababu. a no, woman, a woman. Okay. Her name is Mama and Pokey and Mama and Pokey is the leader of this 60 member cooperative. Two of the four farmer groups we work with are run by women. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah. And then there was a string on the top of that bag before you opened it and the string was uh, taken from one of our cocoa bean bags. Oh, cool. I love it. And this yeah. is a 72% dark chocolate. Yep. And to my knowledge, we've never done a tasting here on the Entree Leadership Podcast. This is not the Food Network. So uh, yeah. we'll see how this goes, but I'm going to try this out. And um, maybe tell me Can you me break a off a piece for me? Can you? Well, this is cool too. You've got the uh, the raised lettering here <laughs> on the actual chocolate bar. Ask right. Nessie chocolate. And yep. here's a bite. Okay. Mm. Oh, wow. That's really good. Oh, thank you. I was only going to have one bite, and now I think I'm going <laughs> to kill this entire bar when we get off here. It's a nice little snack. Mm. So how much chocolate are you guys selling? Well, we go through about um, 40 metric tons of cocoa beans a year. Whoa. That, but to give you an idea, the the uh, Snickers plant, and I think it's in Chicago for Mars, would go through that in two shifts. So it's all relative, but mm. that's a lot of cocoa beans for me from those four origins that I was telling you about. Uh, we have 17 full-time employees. Well, I got to tell you, it tastes amazing. And um, Thank you. 
Thank Everybody you. listening needs to go find some. And, and do you guys go direct to consumer? Can they go to your website and get some chocolate? They can or? go to our website, askanossi.com. Okay. We ship it all over the country and yeah. Well, I want you guys to get the chocolate. I also want you to check out Sean's book, a really incredible story and just so inspiring. The book is titled Meaningful Work, A Quest to Do Great Business, Find Your Calling and Feed Your Soul. Sean, thank you for what you believe in. Thank you for the beacon of hope that you are to small business men and women everywhere. And um, I'm just so inspired by our conversation today. As we wrap up, any final thoughts or words of encouragement to our audience as they're pursuing their purpose in their craft? I would say, uh, I would suggest uh, if you're struggling and and you're you're kind of in a place maybe where you don't know what's next, I would suggest, especially in this time right now, in this time of, of trouble and heartache, to do the thing that is very counterintuitive, and that is look around you, see who needs you, roll up your sleeves and serve someone without expecting anything in return. This is mystical, it's magical, and um, I'm not saying that the ends justify the means. What I'm saying is Jesus said this, Gandhi said, if you want to find yourself, lose yourself in the service of others. Mm. And this is what I, I, I would say, if you're struggling, serve someone who needs you. I love it. He is Sean Askinosi, the chocolate man. You guys got to check out this chocolate. It tastes amazing. I'm about to jump off here and eat the rest <laughs> of this box of chocolate that they sent us uh, with a hand knit, uh, handwritten uh, note from your team to boot. Uh, just a, a really uh, cool uh, symbol of the, the personal touch that you guys put into these things. So thank you, Sean, for your time today. Thanks for all the encouragement and uh, best of luck as you guys uh, move forward and move more chocolate out there and help more people. Thank you. It's been quite an honor. Thank you so much.